Internal energy is the sum, that means total of, kinetic energy and potential energy of all particles in a substance. If we raise the temperature of a substance, the kinetic energy of the particles increases. And if we change the state of the substance, say from solid to liquid, liquid to gas, the potential energy of the particles increases. We can draw a heating curve for something like ice. And over time, as we're giving it heat, we can see that the temperature goes up, but then it flattens out when it changes state at zero and 100 degrees Celsius. So like we said, when things are changing state, specifically solid to liquid, liquid to gas, the heat or the energy that goes in is not contributing to kinetic energy, only potential energy by breaking bonds. Not breaking chemical bonds like covalent bonds, but intermolecular bonds. Okay, so we have an equation that tells us how much energy is needed to raise the temperature of a substance. It's E, you might see Q, but I like E because it's energy, equals mass times specific heat capacity, that's specific to the material, times the change in temperature delta T. For changing state, we have the specific latent heat equation, energy equals M times SLH. I've had a bit of a brain fart there. Don't worry, it's fixed on the mind map. There are two different specific latent heats. You have the specific latent heat of fusion and of vaporization. First is for melting and freezing. Second one is for obviously evaporating and going backwards condensing as well. So the idea and the equations are fairly easy, but they've asked some pretty tricky questions even at GCSE on this lately. If you have a solid that is melting and the temperature goes up, then we know that the energy is equal to M times SHG times delta T and M times SLH, because we need both of those energies to raise the temperature and change the state so therefore we can factorize it we can say energy is equal to mass times shg times delta t plus slh and this is just for a level if two substances come into contact with each other eventually they will end up at a common temperature so if you have a question on this all you have to do is equate those two energies mc delta t okay it might be melting as well but not in this case that i've written down and delta t is going to be the common temperature take away the starting temperature or vice versa okay something that's pretty much just gcse there's three methods of heat transfer one through conduction that's for solids that's when heat is transferred through vibrations because the particles can't move Convection, that's for any fluid, that's liquids or gases. Hot portions of a fluid are less dense because the particles are further apart. They're not bigger, they're just further apart. So it rises and cold fluid falls to take its place. Radiation, that's infrared electromagnetic wave. And that's absorbed specifically by electrons in a material. Okay, the gas laws, Boyle's law is pressure is inversely proportional to volume, that's for a constant temperature. Charles's law, volume proportional to temperature, that's for a constant pressure. And the pressure law, sometimes called the Gay-Lussac law, pressure is proportional to temperature for a constant volume. Complete gas law is PV equals NKT or NRT. Big N, number of molecules, little n, number of moles. K, Boltzmann constant, R, gas constant. It's just converted from K. NRT is much easier to deal with because they're much nicer numbers, R being 8.31. Okay, let's do some thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is this. Q equals delta U plus W. Q being heat that goes into a system, delta U being the change in internal energy, and that's ultimately temperature, and W is work done and a gas has to expand in order to do work. Okay, there are four main types of processes that a gas can undergo. Isothermal, that's when temperature is constant. So that means NRT and NK2 constant. So that means that PV is constant as well. So PV is the same at the start and at the end. So P1V1 equals P2V2. And if the temperature stays the same, then delta U is equal to zero. Isobaric, that's when pressure is constant. Isochoric, that's when volume is constant. We can create proportionality equations similarly for those two. I've put them the wrong way around here, but they're fixed with the mind map. And we have adiabatic. Adiabatic is when there is no heat in or out of a system, so Q is equal to zero. So that means delta U is equal to minus W. It's not PV is constant this time, but it's PV to the power of gamma gamma being the adiabatic constant you'll always be given that you'll never have to remember those the second law can be written like this heat cannot be converted into work unless it flows from a hot space to a cold space so that means you're always going to get a change in temperature somewhere in the system so that means that no engine can be 100 percent efficient kinetic theory there are five assumptions that we need to remember raved r is random motion of particles a is attraction there is none V is volume of particles is negligible, E is elastic collisions, and D, duration of collisions is negligible compared to duration between collisions. Here's the final equation, PV equals third NMC RMS squared, CRMS being root mean square speed. So CRMS squared is also called mean square speed. Be careful that you don't get those two confused. 
If you want to see how to derive PV equals third and MC squared, then have a look at my kinetic theory video. We can use density in the equation. If we divide the whole thing by volume, we end up with NM over V. That is total mass over volume, that's density. So P equals third rho C squared. Let's prove EK equals three halves KT. If you know PV equals a third NMC squared, then we know that's also equal to NKT. Cancelling the ends, we end up with a third MC squared equals KT, very similar to half MC squared for kinetic energy. Equate those two and we end up with kinetic energy is equal to three halves KT. Okay, let's have a look at some engines. This applies for most A-level specifications, but for AQA, it's only if you do engineering physics optional module. Here's the Otto cycle for a petrol engine. We have four strokes. It means the cylinder goes up, down, up, down. First up, down is the exhaust and intake strokes. We're not massively fussed about those, but it undergoes adiabatic compression, and then air-fuel mix is ignited by a spark plug, and then we have the power stroke, where we have the adiabatic expansion. Diesel, on the other hand, looks slightly different. What we have is air compressed and heated, and then we inject the fuel in, and the fuel is ignited by the hot air. The area enclosed in each loop is equal to net work done per cycle. If we times that by the number of cylinders and times that by the cycles per second, then that gives us the indicated power of the engine. And obviously any area under a PV graph is equal to work done. Thermal efficiency is equal to indicated power divided by input power. We don't really use percentages, just decimals now. Mechanical efficiency, brake power, that's output power, divided by indicated power. That's where power and energy is lost due to friction. And overall efficiency, brake power divided by input power. The maximum theoretical efficiency of an engine can be given by the difference in temperatures between the hot space and the cold space divided by the temperature of the hot space. Coefficient of performance for heat pumps and fridges, basically the reciprocal of efficiency. So we end up with a number bigger than one. And for a heat pump, we put hot temperature on top and fridge, we put cold temperature on top because that's what we want for both. And we can replace these temperatures with heat cues and the equations still hold true. Brownian motion, that just describes a random motion of particles inside of gas, and it can be proved by looking at small smoke particles. We can see them wiggling around, which means that we have air particles colliding with them randomly. Lastly, you might have a graph for pressure or volume against temperature. It might be the Charles's law or pressure law experiment, and you can find absolute zero from this without doing extrapolation on the graph because it's very inaccurate. What we have is a straight line graph, y equals mx plus c, or p, let's say, equals mt plus c. We find the gradient m, and we use that at any point on the line to find the y-intercept c, and then we plug that back into the equation for zero pressure, equals m times absolute zero temperature plus c, and hopefully you'll end up with a temperature of about minus 273 degrees Celsius. A field is a part of space where there are invisible forces at work. How do we represent these invisible force fields? Firstly, with field lines. Field lines show the direction of force on a what we call point mass for a gravitational field and a positive, we might call it a test charge for electric fields. So for this diagram, it could be a planet in the middle or it could be a negative charge in the middle. If it was a positive charge, then the lines would go away. And I'm gonna draw some equipotentials on there, ready for a little bit later on. And we can see that this is a radial field. The field is getting stronger as we get closer to the planet or whatever. And we can tell because the field lines are getting closer together. Equipotentials and field lines always cross perpendicular to each other. So I'm just putting in some right angles here. And potential shows how much energy you need to move one kilogram or one coulomb to infinity. But the definition is this. Potential is the work required to move a unit mass or unit charge, depending on the field, from infinity to that point. And that's why they're always negative for attractive fields. Force of attraction between two masses is equal to GMM over R squared. I'll write in the word forms a little bit later on, but its force is proportional to the product of the two masses and inversely proportional to the square of their separation. Coulomb's law, electric force is equal to KQQ over R squared. K is our shortcut constant. In reality, it's equal to one over four pi epsilon zero, epsilon zero being permittivity of free space. But this does give us a nice round number of 9.0 times 10 to the 9. So it's a very useful number to have in your head. Okay, field strength, G is equal to GM over R squared. Very similar to force, we're just missing one of the masses. Similarly for electric field strength, E equals KQ over R squared. So the unit of this is going to be Newtons per kilogram or Newtons per coulomb. So field strength shows you what the force is for one kilogram or one coulomb. And then to get to the actual force from there, all we have to do is times by M. That's why force is equal to MG 
and F equals EQ for electric. Let's go back to potential. Potential is equal to minus GM over R. I'll write the minus in in a bit. And for electric fields, KQ over R. And to get from potential to field strength, we take change in potential and divide by change in distance. Looking at a graph of potential against distance, we always have this y equals one over x curve. The magnitude of the gradient at any point is gonna be equal to the field strength at that point. So that's why field strength has the alternative name, potential gradient. And what else can we do? Well, we can get a change in potential from the graph, and then we can get to potential energy from there. Now I'm gonna call potential energy PE. I'm not just gonna call it E, because we don't wanna get confused between electric field strength and energy. Kinda of wish I'd call it EP, but there we go. Right, potential energy for a gravitational field is GMM over R, and for electric field, KQQ over R. The only difference between these and the equations for force is that we are timesing by a distance. And actually, if you think about it, because of work done, energy or work done is equal to force times distance, so that's how we get from one to the other. Now we can go full circle as well. We can get from potential to energy. We do change in potential times the mass that we are actually moving, or times by the charge that we're actually moving. And that's because potential is joules per kilogram or joules per coulomb. It tells us how much energy a kilogram or coulomb would have. So what we have to do then is times by mass or charge to get the actual joules. If you have a graph of force against distance, the area under the graph is equal to work done. And that should give us the change in potential energy. Speaking of energy, we have two things here. Generally, escape velocity is for gravitational fields. And distance of closest approach is for two like charges. And in both cases, all we do is say the potential energy is equal to kinetic energy. So GMM over R equals half mv squared, and one of the m's cancels, and KQQ over R equals half mv squared. Gravitational field strength, if we draw a graph, we can see that that decreases with one over R squared as well, similar to force, but it's useful to know how field strength changes inside a planet, and it changes linearly because G is proportional to R. And we know it has to go down to zero ultimately because when we get to the center of the planet, we're being pulled in all directions equally. If you have two parallel plates that are charged, then we have a uniform field and electric field strength is equal to just the potential difference between the two plates divided by the separation of the plates. And if you wanna know the force on the charge, just do F equals EQ. Okay, this is one that doesn't crop up that often, but I've seen it confuse the heck out of people because they don't know how to deal with it. If you're asked questions about density of a planet, now density is equal to mass divided by four thirds pi r cubed for a sphere. So therefore density is proportional to m over r cubed. G is proportional to m over r squared, looking at equation down below. So we can see then that the only difference is r between the two things. So G field strength is proportional to rho r, density times radius. I've seen that crop up in multiple choice questions. This question crops up all the time. If we have two masses, then somewhere in between, the resultant field strength is gonna be equal to zero. We can say that the field strengths at that point are equal and opposite. So we can say that GM over R squared equals GM over R squared and G's cancel. That's how you find the resultant field strength, but for potential, doesn't matter how many charges we have providing a potential or where they are, all we do to find the resultant potential at any point is add up all of the potentials. So just GM over R plus GM over R or KQ over R plus KQ over R because it is a scalar. Just a reminder that in between two like charges, potential cannot be zero, but it can be zero in between two different charges because one is providing a positive potential, one's providing a negative potential, they will add up to zero at some point. Here's a magnet with north and south poles. Actually, their full names are north facing and south facing poles. Here I've drawn some field lines to represent the invisible field around a magnet. And they show the direction of the force on a mini north pole, as it were. And so that means they go away from a north pole because it would repel a north pole and go towards the south pole because it would attract a north pole. If you have two magnets and opposite poles facing each other, then the field lines will go from the north pole of one to the south pole of the other. But if you have two like poles, like north and north and south and south facing each other, the field lines will squash together but still not touch. Magnetic field strength, the proper name is actually magnetic flux density. The symbol is capital B and the unit is capital T for Tesla. For A level, you need to know the alternative units. That's V per meter square and Newtons per ampere meter. You also need to know that flux density is equal to flux divided by area. So phi divided by A. So that means that phi equals BA, very important. Even at GCSE, you now need to know the equation for force on a wire carrying a current in a magnetic field. That is if they're all perpendicular. It's F equals BIL. 
F bill. We can measure this force by putting magnets on a yoke, putting that on a top pan balance, put a current through the wire, and then we can record what mass the balance shows. And then we can times that by 9.81 times by G to find the force that is acting on the wire. So we also need to know what the direction of the force is going to be. And that's where Fleming's left hand rule comes in. People always take the mick out of my left hand. So I'm going to try and do a good job this time. I'm actually pretty proud of that one. I think that's probably the best I've ever drawn. Joffed. It's freeze, FBI, thumb is force, first finger is field, second finger is current. And they're all 90 degrees to each other. The current in this is conventional current. For GCSE, that doesn't really mean anything, but at A-level, you need to know that when it comes to free moving charged particles, this second finger is in the right direction for protons and other positive charges moving, but we need to flip it for negative charges like electrons. So F bill and forces on wires is called the motor effect. And we can use this idea in what we call a motor. We have a magnetic field made by two magnets and we have a coil of wire. Now, usually they're gonna be thousands of turns and loops and that's attached to the power supply via split ring commutator. And that's there to make sure that the current flips every half a turn. If the current goes around the loop the same way all the time, then it will just go to the vertical position and then just stop, it won't go any further. The opposite of the motor effect is the dynamo effect. So it's all about when a wire experiences a changing magnetic field or a level change in flux. That's when currents are induced in wires. And dynamos are basically motors, but we turn them and current is induced in the coil. They're very similar, but we don't need a split ring commutator this time. We can just connect the loop to the circuit with brushes. We're okay with the current flipping every half a turn when it comes out. It just means that it's AC and that's fine. If you want to increase the output of a dynamo, then you can put more turns, more loops in the coil. You can use a stronger magnetic field, or you can obviously just turn it faster. For a motor, if you want to increase the speed, then the first two for the dynamo also apply, but then we can increase the voltage or PD of the motor and that will make it turn faster. An A level, if we want to find out the direction of the current, then we use Fleming's right hand rule. Before we go into Lenz's law, let's have a look at transformers because that's a GCSE as well. We need them to step up voltage and step down current outside of a power station before the electricity goes to the national grid. And then we have transformers the other end outside our houses to step down the voltage this time, ready for us to use. And the reason we step up the voltage outside the power station is to reduce the energy lost in the cables due to their resistance. If we have a lower current, then that means that we have less less power or less energy loss due to heating. Okay, this is your basic transformer. We have a primary coil on one side and a secondary coil on the other side. And then we have this soft iron core in the middle. Just be clear, there should be no electricity in the iron core at all, just in the wires wrapped around it. But there is a magnetic field in the core. If it's 100% efficient, then that means the power going in should equal the power coming out. Ideally, we can therefore say that V times I, that's power, is the same across both. So V1 I1 equals V2 I2. And this is a step up transformer because we can see that the secondary coil has twice the number of turns than the primary coil. So we should have double the voltage out and therefore half the current. The more turns we have, the higher voltage. So therefore we can say the ratio of the voltages is equal to the ratio of the number of turns. V1 over V2 equals N1 over N2. And at A level, you need to know that the voltage steps up because the more turns we have, the more flux we're capturing with that coil as it were. There's one more thing about the structure of transformers that you need to know for GCSE. I'll write that down in a few minutes. Okay, that's pretty much it for GCSE. Everything from now on is just going to be A-level. Look at Lenz's law. You need to know this back to front. The direction of induced EMF is such that it will oppose the change that caused it. That's the definition. In other words, if a current is induced, it will make its own field that will try to stop the change that actually caused it to begin with. Currents don't like being induced. Classic example of this is just a magnet and a coil of wire attached to an ammeter. And then we have a magnet being dropped through it. When the magnet's dropped, a current is induced and that will make the ammeter deflect one way. The current makes its own field that balances the weight of the magnet. So therefore we have balanced forces, so therefore it falls at a constant speed. Then between the top and the bottom, the current will flip because it doesn't want the magnet to leave because induced currents are fickle like that. So the ammeter will deflect the other way as well. Once it's all the way out, the current will of course go down to zero again. And Lenz's law applies to transformers because if a current is allowed to be induced in the secondary coil, then the current flowing will actually make its own magnetic field as well that will try and induce a back EMF in the primary coil. So the current that is induced in the secondary coil doesn't want to be there. So if there's no secondary coil or the circuit is disconnected, then that means the primary coil, well, the current can just flow freely. 
but if we do have a circuit attached to the secondary coil, then that current induced will provide a back EMF that will reduce the current in the primary coil, which actually is a good thing. Faraday's law is this, induced EMF is proportional to the rate of change in flux. Here's the equation, epsilon equals minus, that's just for Lenz's law showing that it's the opposite, we don't really care about it, it's not important, and then delta phi by delta t, rate of change of flux. And yeah, we can times by n as well to get the actual EMF induced if we times by the number of turns in the coil. So here's something that counts for GCSE as well. There's three things that you can do to reduce energy losses in a transformer. Number one, you can use low resistance windings for the coils, so just low resistance wires, copper, we say that we make it with a soft iron core. That means that it's easily magnetized and demagnetized. So that way you end up with a really strong magnetic field inside of the core and not a lot of the field escaping as it were. Then finally we have a laminated or layered core. We split the core into layers. And this is to reduce the effect of eddy currents. Now we said we don't want any electricity in the core, but inevitably you're going to get a little bit of current induced in the core itself and then it just goes round and round. And because of the resistance of the core, you end up with energy being lost as heat. So laminating the core reduces these eddy currents. Okay, just eight level again. Faraday's law can be tweaked to be applied to a wire being moved through a field that is perpendicular to the field lines. And the EMF induced is equal to BLV, V being the velocity of the wire through the field. If you don't know where that comes from, have a look at my Faraday's law videos. N phi is given its own name. That's called flux linkage and that's equal to therefore BAN, BAN. That gives you the total amount of flux that's being captured by a coil. So the unit is not just Weber's, it's Weber turns. BLV can also be applied to a rectangular coil that is entering and exiting a magnetic field. Here's a field that I've drawn to show that the field lines are going into the page. One side of the coil is going in, so we can use BLV for that. If it's going at constant speed, then we have a constant EMF as it's entering. Once it's all the way in, we don't have any EMF. When it's exiting, we have a constant EMF again, but it's going to be negative if it was positive when entering. Okay, let's have a look at free charged particles in a field. We know that if their velocity is perpendicular to the field, then they will undergo circular motion. The magnetic force on the particle is equal to BQV, and so we know that's also equal to MV squared over R. Then we can cancel one of the Vs and we can see how things are proportional to each other. Cyclotrons are used to make beams of particles like a proton beam for therapy in a hospital. And we have two Ds and we apply a PD across them and that's in order to accelerate the protons as they cross the gap and their radius increases. But we must make sure we flip the polarity of the Ds every half an orbit of these protons. Therefore, the frequency of the AC we apply to the Ds is going to be the same as the frequency of the particle's orbits. And yes, they all have the same frequency and same time period because it is independent to radius. If you don't know how to prove that, again, look at my magnetic fields lessons. Another application is mass spectrometry. We take atoms or molecules, we ionize them, so they're positively charged. First of all, we put them through a velocity selector where we have an electric and a magnetic field. And it's only particles that have a speed that is equal to the electric field strength divided by the flux density go all the way through. They're the only ones for which force due to the electric field and the force due to the magnetic field are equal and opposite. Once through, they go into another magnetic field. Lighter ions get deflected more from the equation we just saw. Radius is proportional to mass. So we have sensors at these particular positions where they end up. We can tell how many ions we have relative to the other ones. We can use this to find relative abundance of isotopes, for instance. Okay, here's a dynamo or generator. Here's the field going to the right. When the coil is perpendicular to the field lines, we have maximum flux going through the loop, but we actually have no EMF at that point. But when the coil is in line with the field, we have no flux, but we do have maximum EMF. Just because it's at that point that the flux is changing at the greatest rate, kind of like SHM. EMF at any point is given by ban omega sine omega t. So therefore the maximum EMF we can call that epsilon zero, is equal to just ban omega. That's also equal to BLV. Okay, we might have to times by N to get it for a coil with multiple turns. Here's a graph of flux linkage, ban against time. To get the maximum EMF, we can either use ban omega, or we can get the gradient when we have no flux linkage. That's the maximum gradient. Much more accurate to use the equation though. Okay, let's go back to Lenz's law. Let's finish off back EMF. This happens in a transformer like we've seen already, but it also happens in motors. When the motor is made to spin, 
that actually has a bit of dynamo effect as well. And so we have an EMF induced in the coil that's actually trying to battle the voltage that's making the motor spin. It's a good thing because that reduces the current in the coil in the motor. So when a motor is spinning fast, we can say it has a light load. We have a high back EMF, so the current is small. But if you have a heavy load or if we stop the motor from spinning, there's going to be less back EMF produced. So that means the current is going to be quite high in the coil. And actually, that's why motors burn out if they're under too heavy load. Power station, it has a generator in, but actually the magnet is in the middle. Well, it's an electromagnet. And then we actually have three sets of coils or stators around the outside. That makes three currents that then go to the national grid. We call those three phases. Houses just use one phase, but factories can combine all three phases to get a really high voltage. Overhead cables, they have a steel core, that's for strength, and then they're surrounded by aluminium. Aluminium is good because it has a fairly low resistance, but it's far lighter and far cheaper than copper. Finally, to find the power lost in cables, we can't just use the voltage from the power station and do V squared divided by R. No, instead we need to do P equals VI for the power station first to get the current that's coming out, and then we plug that into I squared R to find the power loss in the cables. Okay, so a couple of letters. If you have an isotope or element or nucleus X, that's any nucleus, then we give the letter A to the mass number, that's the number of protons and neutrons, and Z to the atomic number, that's just the number of protons. And we do use A and N for different things later on, so just be aware of what the context is. So the mass number, even though it's not exactly the same, we can say that it's measured in relative atomic mass units, which is U. Now one U is equal to 1 12th the mass of a carbon 12 atom. That's the definition, not just the nucleus. And then we give the letter capital N to the number of neutrons here at least. And so therefore that's going to be equal to A take away Z. So here's a graph of N against Z. If we draw a line of N equals Z, just going diagonally upwards, we have a curve that lies above that. And that shows where the majority of naturally occurring isotopes lie. Generally, things have more neutrons than protons. At the bottom, we have beta minus emitters. At the top, heavier nuclei, we have alpha emitters. And then down the bottom, we have beta plus positron emitters. They don't occur naturally. They only exist if we dope nuclei with protons. If we blow this up just to have a little section of it, then we can see what's going on when things go through alpha and beta minus decay. I'm not going to draw beta plus on here. Alpha, it goes down two in both directions. Beta minus, we have a neutron turning into a proton. So that means it goes down and to the right. Just be aware that sometimes you might not see N on the y-axis, you might see A. So you'll have to change your thinking accordingly. The more neutrons something has, the more unstable it is. The more likely it is to decay. So let's go on to binding energy then. Binding energy is the energy needed or work required to separate a nucleus or an atom into its constituent parts. So we just have a helium nucleus and to separate it into two protons, two neutrons, we need to put in energy. The nucleus is lighter than its constituents. The way I think about it is we're buying back the mass with the energy that we put in. The difference in mass is called the mass defect. That's the mass gained or lost in any interaction. It's very unusual that we're talking about a nucleus being exploded into its constituents completely. And the energy released or put into the interaction is equal to the mass defect times C squared. Okay, technically I should have said delta E. So you can do kilograms times speed of light squared and that gives you joules, or we can use the nice shortcut because usually we deal with relative atomic mass units in this situation. One U is equivalent to 931.5 mega electron volts of energy. So we don't need to go around the houses. Fusion is when we have two light nuclei, like deuterium, that's heavy hydrogen here, colliding and fusing together to make one nucleus, in this case helium. And these need to have a lot of energy in order to overcome the electrostatic repulsion and get these nuclei to within the range of the strong nuclear force so they can fuse together. So when we fuse two light nuclei together, we end up with a more stable nucleus. It's also lighter and the lost mass has been converted into energy. If it's more stable, then the helium will have a higher binding energy, or we should say a higher overall binding energy, or binding energy per nucleon. We can say that it's fallen down a potential well. Binding energy is increased because now you need more energy to separate the helium compared to the energy that you would have needed to separate the deuterium. And energy is released in the form of electromagnetic radiation and kinetic energy. As to how much of each, well, that's a bit random. 
Fission is when we have a heavy nucleus. So let's take uranium-235, which is what we use in nuclear reactors. We induce fission by bombarding these nuclei with neutrons. A neutron will be absorbed by the nucleus of uranium. It becomes more unstable, and then it will split into two daughter nuclei. They'll be a bit random, and also two or three more neutrons. And they will go on to cause more fission, and that's where we get our chain reaction from. How can we get energy out when we do fusion and fission, even though they're the opposite to each other? Well, it's all to do with binding energy per nucleon, or we might think of it as total binding energy or average binding energy. This is the graph showing how binding energy per nucleon changes with number of nucleons. It goes up, we have that little spike, and then it goes up and then comes back down slowly. The peak is at iron 56. Iron 56 is the most stable isotope out there. Nuclei will fuse to make heavier and heavier ones until they reach iron and then stop, and similarly for fission. The little spike is helium-4. That's uncharacteristically stable because we have a perfect tetrahedron. That's a little pyramid of four nucleons. They're all touching each other. You don't get that with any heavier nuclei. When light nuclei fuse, we end up making more stable products. We get energy out, so therefore the binding energy per nucleon goes up. The products have fallen down lower into this potential well, as we can call it. So we would need more energy to get them out, as it were, to explode the nuclei. Therefore, binding energy increases. And again, similarly for fission. But that's not the end of the story, because in a nuclear reactor, we have fuel rods, yes, containing uranium-235. That's been refined from uranium ore. But in between the rods, we need a moderator. And that can be water or graphite. Now, the moderator slows down neutrons. Neutrons aren't absorbed, but they do lose energy and momentum they're slow to thermal speeds as we say and so then they can be absorbed by the uranium in the fuel rods if it wasn't for the moderator the neutrons would just ping straight through the fuel rods they wouldn't be absorbed we need them to be slow enough for that to happen and then in between all of this we have the control rods the control rod is our on off switch as it were they can be made out of boron what they do is absorb neutrons completely without causing any more fission if we need more power from the reactor, then we just lift up the control rods. If we need less power, we just drop them in between the fuel rods so fewer neutrons are crossing from fuel rod to fuel rod. One more thing, the coolant is the fluid. In this case, it's carbon dioxide that the rods are all dunked in, as it were. This coolant takes the heat away from the rods and takes it to the boiler or heat exchanger where it gives it to water for it to be made into steam, which then turns the turbine. Okay, radioactivity, the first equation that we need to know is A equals minus. We don't really care about the minus too much apart from when deriving stuff, but minus lambda N. A being activity, we measure that in Becquerel, that decays per second. Yes, we can measure activity in decays per other units of time as well, like days or years, whatever, but usually it's Becquerel. N being the number of nuclei that can decay, and lambda being the decay constant. Decay constant is measured in seconds to the minus one. Okay, it could be hours or days or years to the minus one as well, just so long as it matches with the unit for activity. And this gives you the probability of a nucleus that you're looking at decaying in the next second or hour or year or whatever. Okay, here's the decay equation. The ratio of activity now compared to original activity, that also goes for n number of nuclei and mass as well, is equal to e to the minus lambda t. These are just ratios between 0 and 1. And they just tell you how much of an original amount you have left. If you want to find lambda or t, then we just natural log both sides. So we end up with log. Yes, I can say log. Don't have to say long. A over A0 equals minus lambda t, for example. If this ratio is equal to a half or 0 0.5, then the time is equal to the half-life, the time taken for the activity to half. And pretty much whenever you're given the half-life, you know you're going to have to find out what the decay constant is. If you want to know how to derive this, then have a look at my radioactivity video. But the equation is lambda equals log 2 over the half-life. Inverse square law tells you that intensity of radiation decreases with distance according to the inverse square law. So intensity i is proportional to 1 over r squared. You might see x squared or d squared instead, doesn't matter. Intensity, usually we measure that in like counts per second or counts per minute. Not Becquerel, because Becquerel is the actual activity of the source, not what we're measuring. So that means that I1, R1 squared equals I2, R2 squared. 
Okay, capacitors. Here's a standard circuit for charging and discharging a capacitor. Okay, I've taken a little bit of artistic license with the symbol for the capacitor here, but you get the idea. Two plates that can store charge. Okay, maybe we should say store charge that has energy. If we increase PD across a capacitor, then the charge increases as well. This is when fully charged that is, and they're proportional to each other. And so we have a constant and that's equal to the gradient. We call this capacitance. It's measured in farads or just capital F, or we can think of them as coulombs per volt, the amount of charge stored per unit PD. So that means C equals Q over V or more commonly known as Q equals VC. And the area under the graph gives you the energy stored. So the energy is a triangle, so that means it's equal to half QV. Substituting Q equals VC into that, we can also end up with E equals half CV squared or half Q squared over C. Okay, when we're charging, we don't have to charge through a resistor, but if we don't, then it just charges instantaneously. But if we charge through a resistor, then we get this exponential curve, but flipped, and it levels out or plateaus at the voltage or PD of the power supply or battery that it's connected to. And at any given time, that voltage is gonna be shared between the charging resistor and the capacitor. At the beginning, the resistor has all of that PD, capacitor has none, and then at the end, it's the other way around. So I've just drawn a dotted line there to show what's happening to the resistor as we charge the capacitor as well. But what we can also do is use a variable resistor instead to make sure that the current is staying constant as it charges. And usually that's the case when it comes to calculations. And in that case, we can just use Q equals IT to find the charge stored on the capacitor. I've added that onto the PDF. Okay, we're more interested in how a capacitor discharges through a resistor and the resistor is now the one that's labeled R on the circuit. And this is the reason why I've put nuclear and capacitors together because they share very similar equations for exponential decay. This time to the power of minus T over RC, R being resistance of the resistor it's discharging through and C being the capacitance. So we're not really concerned with half-life with capacitors, but we are concerned with when we have a time that is equal to RC. If that's the case, we have e to the minus rc over rc so that means that we end up with e to the minus one that gives us 0 0.37 so that means that this magic number 37 percent of the original value it doesn't matter what original value you can choose that's how long the time constant is so time constant is equal to rc and that tells you how long it takes to get to 37 percent of its original value and this can be voltage but it can also be charge and current as well this is a very simple diagram of what a capacitor can look like. We have two parallel plates. The area of the plates we call A, separation of the plates we call D, and we can have something in between as well called a dielectric. The equation that gives you capacitance from these is A epsilon zero, that's permittivity of free space, epsilon R, that's relative permittivity divided by D. Epsilon zero never changes, that's a universal constant. Epsilon R is just a factor that we multiply by. It's just one for air or a vacuum, but then anything else that's in between is going to be more than one. And the way that it works is that with pretty much any material, you have little dipoles, molecules, and one end is gonna be slightly more positive, one end is gonna be slightly more negative than the other. So I've got here delta plus, delta minus. And these can turn to line themselves up along the field lines between the two plates. And that strengthens the field. And this actually makes the top and the bottom of the dielectric charged here. So that's why it actually requires work to remove the dielectric because the edges of the dielectric are attracted to the plates. Okay, so if we change an aspect of a capacitor like the area or the distance or the relative permittivity by adding or removing a dielectric, then we need to know how that changes the amount of energy stored. So it depends on whether the capacitor is still connected or is disconnected from the battery. If it's connected, then that means the PD, V stays constant. So that means the charge and the capacitance change. And in that case, we use the equation E equals half CV squared. We want one where only one thing is changing. And so that's C in this case. So therefore we can say E, the energy is proportional to the capacitance. So we can see how much bigger or smaller the energy is compared to the original amount. If it's disconnected, then charge is constant and V and C change instead. So therefore we use E equals half Q squared over C. E is proportional to one over C. Last but not least, we can draw log graphs to get a nice straight line instead of having a curve. Usually you'll see minus log V over V zero, give you a nice straight line that's proportional to T and the gradient is therefore equal to one over RC. But you might see just a log V on the Y axis instead and you'll end up with a Y intercept of log V zero and we have a negative gradient. So therefore the gradient is equal to 
minus one over RC. If you don't know what I'm talking about here, then have a look at my video on the required practical for capacitors. Okay, and here I'm just adding a few things that I forgot at the time. Some nuclei can exist in what we call a metastable state. Meta means kind of. The typical example is molybdenum decaying via beta minus into technetium, atomic number 99. Once the technetium nucleus is formed, it can stay in a higher energy level for a relatively long period of time before dropping down to its ground state and emitting a gamma photon. One thing I forgot about the nuclear reactor was waste products. Once enough uranium has decayed inside the rods the rods will be useless because they can't maintain a chain reaction anymore they're still radioactive and actually other bits of the reactor are going to be radioactive as well because of all the neutrons flying around so we take this radioactive stuff and we place it deep underground but we vitrify it first we encase it in glass molten glass which then solidifies the reason we use glass is because it's non-porous that means that stuff can't seep through and get into say water supplies that'd be bad news don't forget that whenever we measure a count rate with a detector, a GM tube or whatever, we need to take away a background count from every reading that we make. Some sources of background radiation are radon gas from stones, ground and buildings, cosmic rays and also medical equipment. Very quickly we have Rutherford scattering. That was when Rutherford fired alpha particles at a thin gold foil. Most of them went through but about 1 in 10,000 were deflected back. This showed that the nucleus was small compared to the atom and it was also positive. And then we have the nuclear radius equation. It's R radius of a nucleus is equal to R0. That's just the nuclear radius constant. You'll always be given that times A to the power of a third. That's the number of nucleons. More often than not, we're just asked to compare two nuclei, so therefore we can say R1 over A1 to the third equals R2 over A2 to the third. So I hope that's helpful. If it is, then please leave a like. If you want to test your knowledge on this, then click on the card and it'll take you to my flashcard questions. See you there.